Thank you for the talk. It's been really, really fascinating. A lot of things to think about. I have two main questions. Oh dear. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, number one, you kind of mentioned offhandedly near the start of your speech about the contrast between the colonial narrative of say, um, say Paul mm-hmm. Hill versus Bukit China. And I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on that juxtaposition of colonial narratives. And the second question I had is, I was wondering if you had any like value judgments or opinions you wanted to make about this kind of, like you said, this kind of ethnic and myth-making rewriting of history and the revision of historical narratives. Right. Um, okay. But Big question, actually. <laughs> um, I think I'll comment first on the. Let's go back to the map of language. Uh, it's over there. Yeah. Saint Paul. Oh, pointer. <laughs> <laughs> and also there's a touch paper here. So Chinese area here, such area there. But anyway, um, I think I think I think this uh, I think you pointed out correctly that actually this repre- I think this represents a sort of like main problem of how to tell the story of Malacca and Malacca history, right? Because uh, the historical sources for pre-colonial Malacca are pretty scant, uh, and mo- many people rely on the Sejarah Melayu, uh, which its earliest extant copy, I think, dates back to 1612, uh, and we don't know who wrote it, and 1612 is like a full hundred years after the fall of Malacca South in it. We don't know who wrote it, or whether it was a person or a collective, um, and obviously it has fantastical episodes like the, you know, Thumbing Sari, the magic sword that makes someone in, 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 invincible and all that. So, you know, um, using the Sram Layu as a sort of like pure historical factual source, it's like using Romeo and Juliet as a historical source for the city of Verona. Uh, okay, like maybe not that bad. But, I'm, uh, uh, oh God, don't, don't kill me, viewers. <laughs> um, but the point is, um, we, and then we, have, you know, we have this general problem of how to represent Malankan history in terms of whether, because if we just rely on those things, then we rely entirely on a, a very, very much colonial, heavy narrative. Um, so, you know, with St. Paul's Hill, I think you have here laid the, the Dutch in the set house, same uh, Princess Saviour and the, the, the church on top of the hill is Portuguese, uh, and then you have the Cock Tower, which is uh, British. Right. So you have in one place um, all of the three colonial powers um, and in contrast and, and also you have to take note of the museums that are available around St. Paul's Hill which are like the Maritime Museum um, the so like Malacca History Museum okay that one has a bit of curries and all that um, the Democracy Museum <laughs> horrible horrible <laughs> museum um, but it's supposed to be a post-independent they have a ballot box in front and all that they have um, the governor's house, they use the ex administrator governor's house as a museum, uh, and of course, there's the replica of the Portuguese man of war. So, if you look at the kind of things available, this is very much sort of like colonial district. Uh, and historically, as well, this area was more of a Chinese quarter, uh, which I have here. Uh, I have here a little graph. Uh, 1828, a uh, little graph. Oh, can I put it there? Yeah. Oh, do you want it to be there? Or should I do it? Oh, I can just leave it there later. But, you know, this is uh, basically a 1828 little graph from Comte Edmond Figo de la Guan. I'm probably butchering this French man. Um, um, but this is supposed to represent a temple in the, Chi- in the Chinese quarter in Malacca. And there's some dispute over whether this is actually uh, Sam Boteng or not. It's not sure. No one is really sure, but it could be. Um, but you can see the sort of like geographically and historically, the two have always been this is the Chinese quarter, this is the colonial quarter. Yeah. So. Oh, the second question. Are you. Uh, 
Yeah, so you can change parts of the raft that you or Yes. Or is it only that type? Um is it in the country? Is that Yeah. So um as to your second question, uh a value judgment on sort of like this ethnic <sighs> That's a very tough question. Um, I think, okay, so I think what's important to note here, right, the, this, this, this sort of presentation is not meant as a diatribe against the erasure of Chinese memory, right? Um, I think what we see here, actually, from how the narrative evolves is that there are colonial narratives in place and colonial history in place here as well in Bukit China, but that's subsumed because it doesn't really fit in with the story they're trying to tell. And my point is that when we, in, in these sort of like narratives where we have to miniaturize episodes of history into um, basically policy points or sort of like policy arguments, that a lot gets lost in those histories. Um, and obviously at play here is a sort of self minoritization, self ethnicization, where you know, China, uh, we, we, uh, Malacan interests are reconfigured, uh, and at the same time, you know, there's very, and, and especially in Malacan studies, this is, a, this is something that needs to be expanded, is the, the, the sort of role of people like the Orang Lao uh, in, in place. Um, so I would recommend reading Leather and Dyer's book if you're interested in the role of, you know, going beyond the sort of narrative of Malacca as purely like a Malay, Chinese, Indian kind of place, but really, a sort of like multiracial place where a lot of negotiations, a lot of different things were going on. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, we have tons of questions, but maybe a simple one would be since you know, there's all these changes back to Kamu, uh, Raja and all that, at the same time, they have allowed this massive Chinese development with a name like Kamu Tian So it seems to contradict each other. So that's that, how does that, and it's a very prominent location, right, on the coast. Yeah, well, it's, it's reclaimed land, so, like, I mean, you know. Reclaimed land or reclaimed land? Yeah, so it's. It's where the Portuguese are now, right? Ah, okay, so it enroaches, it enroaches into parts of, so Pulau Malacca and, and all that does enroach on parts of the Portuguese settlement, yeah. uh, and, and would, um, and in and could very possibly affect their livelihoods, especially the fishermen there. Yeah, um, I mean, I I think the sort of like political considerations are. I don't necessarily think administrators think of the contra deep contradictions between and deep ironies of accepting Chinese investment on one hand and pushing out, uh, you know, or sort of like narrativizing in a certain way. Uh, but do you think like the opposition, like what happened in the 80s on development of China can still take place today? Or will they mm -hmm. be able to bulldoze it? Right. Uh, it's really in the context of today. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think that's falling into several traps, right? Which is, one is that it's falling into the, the, the trap of equating um, Chinese investment, mainland Chinese investment, with Malaysian Chinese movements. I think that's one of the sort of like rhetorical devices that is used against activists who are trying to advocate on behalf of um, Malaysian Chinese interests, Malaysian Chinese sort of like peripheral concerns, where there is a lot of Chinese development. And I think that's a, that's a, that's one of the traps that activists have become very wary of not equating like, oh yes, Chinese investment equals Malaysian Chinese, right? And I think that's, that's one of the pitfalls. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also sort of my abstract you mentioned that uh, in the text of my government in the 1980s, uh, one of the strategies that the subsequent set up by the government is an appropriation of the Malaysian yeah. Um, yeah. So I think 
to sort of like answer this question, we can go back to Antoine, right? So in my sort of like larger thesis, um, I actually sort of like start the 1980s, but I go into the 1990s and the, the, the early 2000s as well. And the reason why I do that is because I sort of like look at the development of how Malaccan Chinese adopt and appropriate different parts of Malay identity. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the answers to as to why why is it that Hangtua, the Hangtua myth is so persistent is that, you know, if you look at the sort of like pervasiveness of the Hangtua myth and when it really pops up and when, you know, a historian like Ku Kei Kim had to finally write a newspaper article saying Hang Tua is not Chinese. In fact, I don't think Hang Tua existed. And then uh, and everybody goes nuts when he says that. Like, oh, no, 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 go back, go back to your whole Because uh, so that, that is like, oh God, no, that's terrible. Um, that's even worse than Hang Tua being Chinese. Uh, because I think you have to understand Hang Tua as a sort of like central founding figure in the sort of like Malay mythos. Um, you know, you have Gilgamesh, you have Alexander the Great, and then you have Hang Tuah, right? The sort of like epitome of, of Malayness. And really the sort of like big debate around Hang Tuah happens in the late 1990s. And of course the context of the late 1990s is really the struggle between Anwar and Mahathir. And I don't think it's a coincidence that at the same time the sort of like the, 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 the key things that Hang Tuah is known for and the, 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 the most important story in the Hang Tuah story is the story of Hang Tuah and Hang Chapai. And really it's a story of the relation of the ruler to the rule of the role of what, what, what it means to be loyal and what it means to Mamboronta, what it means to be the Hakka. And I don't think, and, and in this time when sort of like the narrative pops up again, the narrative pops up around Anwar Ibrahim as is he Hang Jabat? Is he Hang Tua? Is Mahathir the Sultan? <laughs> uh, and maybe that might pop up soon enough again. Um, but, and you can trace all these, and this is also in the, you can trace the rise of media, right? The rise of online media. Blogs are starting to become a thing in the late 1990s. And it's really in these blogs that, you know, these random uncles start spewing their linguistic theories of hang, hang tua, 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 yeah. Um, and I think actually it's important because I think what it is, is that in an era of deep Chinese anxiety over their place in Malaysia, in an era where the narrative being, well, that was being put forth was, uh, you vote, either vote for Mahathir, or you vote for DP, which is supposedly your defender, but they're not allied with past. And Anwar Ibrahim is on their side, and Anwar Ibrahim is obviously the ultimate Malay supremacist because he's with Abid. Of course, that narrative has entirely changed today, uh, but at that time, those were the kind of considerations that the Chinese community was being placed in. And I think that constitutes a sort of like existential anxiety over you know, what it means to be Malaysian Chinese, how do we negotiate this place which is under threat. And I see the sort of appropriation of, oh, actually, Hakpo is Chinese as an attempt to say that no, actually we are important, that we that and you know Chinese people have always been around, that we have a pre colonial history in Malaysia and in Malaya. Because if you don't have Hang Lipo, if you don't have Hang Tua, then the sort of like first big Chinese figures that come out are really as colonial capitals. And and, and you saw and we saw this in the way capitans were were represented as well as Confucian court officials or as developers and what was really downplayed in the narrative of Bukit China was the fact that Capitans were worked very closely with colonial governments. That was quite posh. Um, and then, you know, I go from the 1990s to the early 2000s. You know, obviously 08 was a very important year politically. Uh, and what's interesting then is that the Malacca Peranakan Association applied for Bumi Putra status after elections. Uh, yeah, I don't usually talk about the Peranakan stuff because Peranakan people are very sensitive over. <laughs> so, you know, oh, that's not Nyonya. Oh, like, okay. oh, not authentic. You know, all that kind of thing. But I think I think it represents anxiety in 
in 2008 over uh, the place of, of being ethnically ambiguous, the place of being, you know, I may be Peranakan, but people and the government still views me as Chinese. Uh, and actually what's interesting is the Malacca state government at the time said, yeah, sure, we'll support your faith to be Bumi Putra, Peranakan people. Um, and obviously that never made it to parliament. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the heritage status, the UNESCO heritage status in Malacca, I, I, <laughs> I, it, it's a tricky hobby that I know I've asked right. you maybe before, but with the awarding of the heritage status for Penang and Malacca, right, it mm. came as a set, it's like buy one, free one. Mm. Um, how has that, uh, has that had any impact on the narrative around Bukit China? How has that, how has Bukit China played into that narrative? Right. Um, okay. Uh, to 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 sort of like keep everybody up to speed, um, when you know, when uh, Penang applied for UNESCO World Heritage status, they were told that you can't apply on your own. You need what you need to do is you need to apply as a pair, Penang and Malacca together. And of course, Singapore was like, "Hey, I'm the leftover settlement people." <laughs> but they were like, "Nah, sorry, you got out. You lost the deal when you got out in 1965." Right. <laughs> and also, you need to support the national. Ah, yeah. So. And also, they're uh, like all even for Amsterdam, right? Okay. okay. So, <laughs> honestly, they're not all buildings. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, there's a, there's a whole debate over whether heritage needs to be old, quote unquote. But uh, the point being. Yeah. Uh, they had to apply together as a pair, um, and uh, Malacca, you know, was subsequently listed as UNESCO World Heritage status, which I think is the worst thing that happened to Malacca. Um, but um, um, I think, in terms of the specific case of Bukit China, it's interesting because you would think that after the UNESCO World Heritage status that the natural progression would be, wow, we have so many Chinese tourists coming nowadays, let's make Hobi China a huge highlight. That has not happened. Um, the, the temple at its foothill has become a sort of stop and has the Japanese memorial, um, but the hill itself with the cemetery has not. Um, and I need to verify why this is the case. My research hasn't got there yet, but my hunch is has to do with how the temple committee has handled the issue, um, right. which is what? well. I, th I think this. Uh, no, don't take my word for it because I haven't verified this and I haven't talked to the temple committee. But my hunch is that um, there are many, many people's families, uh, members who are still buried there. You don't want to turn a cemetery where living relatives are still there into a tourist walking ground. Uh, that would be very um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I think my question is, if you can go back to the slide where you had that, um, the cut room. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what put it right. Yes, so, yeah, so, uh, it's interesting because here we are, so I think my question is more of this, so it's not just a narrative of like, so, government versus Chinese, but also mm. Chinese versus Chinese. Yeah, right, there yeah. are two narratives here, mm. right? So to give a context, uh, even though I went to Chinese independence school, the Dong Zong way of saying that we have struggled since God knows when, right? And it's interesting that you say that 84, they kind of started this movement of uh, re denunciation in a way. Mm. So I wonder, when, have, you, have you come across, so just to zoom in just the Chinese versus Chinese narrative, what 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 have you learned about what have you seen, right? Mm -hmm. through, through, through especially all these Chinese newspapers, right? Because right. it's not just uh, the, the narrative seems to also be the the Capitan which, and also so like the descendants of the Capitan, the rich man, versus perhaps at that point some of the still more communist uh, socialist ideal. But again this is a lot from just Mm -hmm. Looking at the present day, the battle over UEC yeah, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. There's these two narratives of Chinese. So right. I wonder what. You know, um, is this long running or is it? Yeah, I mean, people who just want to visit their relatives' graves. No, 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 like, I don't know. Um, so, so, you know, this, and this, that was the sort of like narrative that played out. But um, I think very quickly when the sort of like 
narrative expanded and reconfigured to be a Chinese rights issue, then MC very, very, very quickly changed its track. Um, and why did it change? Now, now that 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 is, uh, it can't really be sure because you know, as with any sort of like, you know, if you're an activist, you make decisions, you don't think about like ten years from, you don't really think like twenty years from now, this is going to result in a self minoritization thing, right? You think like strategically, what is the best argument I can make, the most compelling argument I can make for the historical significance of this site? Um, and I think you know activists may have stumbled upon that argument, um, and uh, and for for them at that time was the right decision. Um, and I don't think anyone can fault them for that. Um, yes. Um, I think you know because a lot of things happened in 1984, right? It was yeah. before Rasulam. Actually, in 1984, it was just about 10 years after. Uh, nature, uh, the National Cultural Park Police NCC, mm. and that actually, I think that plays into mm. that issue as well. And and also not to forget that in in early 1980s, just about uh, 81 or 82, actually lion dance was not allowed until you get permit, and mm. there there was a lot of issues uh, surrounding all these uh, national cultural policy. And mm. I think that where the Chinese so-called Chinese anxiety comes from. Mm. I'm, I'm just oh yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. I think yeah. No, I think I think you. What you're saying is right. There's, a, there's actually a lot of things going on, yeah. which I don't really cover that much. Um, um, but I think I think you're you're right in saying that the general cultural anxiety, um, is what is being propagated is really a narrative of crisis, right? That we need to defectively defend this culture, or it will be erased. Um, and that kind of narrative of existential threat is very, very powerful in terms of, you know, sort of like minority, oh, the siege mentality. Um, and of course, you see it play out in all ethnicities, in a lot of ethnicities in Malaysia. I'll just check this from both. Right. Um, I think, you know, it's more of a futurist like, point of view. Um, now that Mohan is back, Said, um, <laughs> 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 I'm gonna get jump off for this, am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also think right now. Uh, okay. No cooker bridge. No, not fine. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Right now that Mahathir is back, and he has said some interesting comments doubling down on like the racial um, treatment of certain groups. Mm. Like, do you see the resurgence? you foresee the resurgence of more Chinese anxiety or like what um, would you think of that? I, I, th- I don't, I, I think it's too early to say um, you know, I think generally most Malaysian Chinese are overjoyed with the <laughs> results of the election, generally speaking oh, no. um, but um, and I guess this is me switching from historian to uh, I used to work in the you know, political so uh, me switching from historian to political, um, I, th- I think um, the the narrative. So I think what is important to note is that Fami Reza recently had a talk, right? And he talked about should we change the Malaysian history textbooks? Uh, and you know he he had a documentary called Sepuluh Tahun Sepuluh Merdeka where he talked about the sort of leftist movement that resulted in a general strike. Um, and this was very quickly picked up by places like Utusan, where they they portrayed him as a communist sympathizer. Uh, and that is the ultimate evil, of course. <laughs> uh, so I think what you have is basically a lot of activists and a lot of people post this general election are like, ah, finally, we can talk about all these things, we can reconfigure history, we can correct the history books, blah, 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 uh, and, and finding that, uh, you know, it's more complicated than that, and a lot of consideration, and, and in fact, if I'm going to go on the limb, I would say that um, I, 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 I believe that this government will be even more careful not to touch these things uh, than, than, than before, uh, because of its perceived precarious position. Um, 
So I think the battle over history is going to keep resurfacing. I think if I'm going to go on the further limb, the <laughs> ultimate battle of Malaysian memory is really May 1969. God, maybe you should cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but you know it's, it's really on May 1969, uh, and I've done work prior. I mean on May 69 before because my area of study is ethnic conflict and genocide. Uh, not to say that it was genocide, but it was definitely an ethnic conflict, right? Um, and I think that that will be the ultimate battleground, right? The ultimate testing field. I don't think it will end. I don't think, I think any historian today, and maybe professor you could elaborate on how you view as an academic today, uh, venturing into May 6th and will still find themselves in trouble, even though it's a new Malaysia. You are referring to? You. <laughs> <laughs> no, professor. Oh. Okay, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's still, of course, it's still yeah. very, very super sensitive. And also, there is so much stigma. Mm. People don't. Yeah. So, so to that, to that, to that, to the the answer is yes. Okay. Short answer yes. Yes. What's your take on this ethnic con- conflict being truly a caste conflict instead? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Well, you know, this is not really the you know topic of today's talk, but um, but I, I think you can't really, I, you know, if I have to go on a limb again, yeah, I don't think you can really say it's an ethnic conflict or a class conflict, right? I think you you have to be a lot more nuanced than that, and you have to sort of recognize that uh, these two things, especially in our country, are intricate, inextricably tied. Um, so that's a lousy answer. <laughs> Uh, you were referring to 1969 or 1984? Uh, okay, well, I think a lot of it has been uh, camouflaged in many ways as an uh, ethnic race conflict. Mm. But actually, I would recommend a certain piece uh, by Dan Zi Hao um, <laughs> about self minoritization. Highly mm. recommend. I think that's an important sort of consideration as you know we speak in this space with Chinese folks mostly a Chinese, <laughs> Malaysian Chinese audience in terms of the dangers of self-minoritization and sort of like thinking, oh, we're the ultimate victim right. um, without recognizing the sort of like very that there are, you know, that, that there are real sort of like socio-economic and political considerations um, and ideologies at play. Maybe just to try and steer back towards the, the thing because it feels like you wanted to go back there. No, 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 I mean, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> no, but I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was interested in this idea of the mean uh, in your research. You know, so, so these narrative structures, mm. uh, of these kind of uh, thematic structures, mm. um, that, that you're focusing very specifically on the thematic I'm just wondering if um, you could um, comparatively use it on other discourses that have been emerging. I mean, things like, you know, the the Kambit and all of the books, like Sultan Kwasa, La Aloy, Rajahula, and and, and are there other types of discourses? Right, right. Um, I think, I think, I think generally, um, I, I, you know, I I don't know much about the Kambit and I'll say that, but, but I, I would say that, you know, any sort of, nar- mostly um, narratives that rely on establishing the prime founder are always very fraught with simplifications and always very fraught with, with you know, complications. Um, uh, I, I started this, this project actually um, because I was interested in, 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 in the general school of history which subscribes to uh, you could say little people history, um, but the sort of like history, you know, his, history is uh, actually at least I think in Malaysia is still the case. History is often told either through the great figures or huge social movement, uh, and I think the s- stories to be told in the little um, interactions and dynamics between people. So, 
not really an answer, but that's what I would say to, you know, I would, uh, that's how I would treat any sort of like narrative that says this guy is the bona fide, bona fide OG on the person. News, it's a piece of news, and then it was written in around 1930s or 40s, I can't really remember the date. And then it talks about Sudan Hossa, the, the mm. history of uh, during Sudan Hossa time. And then it also mentioned that actually uh, the Chinese, they were in two groups. One supporting uh, Rajamati and another one, uh, the other group. And then actually, more than a thousand Chinese were killed because they were killing each other. And then I'm just thinking, and how do how, how can we relate this to the memory of of Chinese lives or of Chinese history in Malaysia? Since that the killing of 1969 is so well memorable, I mean the memory just you know transmit from one generation to another. But then the 1,000 people, 1,000 1,000 Chinese killed mm. is not um, you know it's not it's not even in our memory. I feel like but, but I don't know how true that piece is. Mm. I'm I'm just saying that um yeah. What what memory uh you know get highlighted mm, and yeah. what not and then this is a would be a something very interesting to prop up. Yeah, I thought, I think that's an excellent point. Like what what is remembered? Uh, I mean any any sort of act of remembering is an act of curation. We choose what to remember, and every time we remember it, it's never really quite a representation of what actually happened. Um. So. Yeah. So it's not related to that. Um, no, 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 no. But I think it's uh, interesting to know that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Coming back to the coming back, bringing the topic back to Cape China. Um, you, you started your whole talk about how you came, you became interested in this because of the story of your father. Yes. Right. So given that, in a way, there's a new generation who has fed this mythology, but the new generation that has not lived through a revision or you know mm. bouncing back and forth of the history of Soviet China. So did you manage to follow up um, on how say someone in your generation is starting to remember or narrativize the history of Soviet China? Right. Uh, mm, that's a good question. Uh, it's lit. <laughs> You're from Malacca, right? <laughs> 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 do you, what do you know about Soviet China like <laughs> is it Hang Li Po well or Perigi Raja? Dude, my family doesn't tell me all these things. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just tell me like... It's <laughs> like nothing really. Yeah, really. It's like, well, yeah, I, mean, no, I, I mean, I think... I think I think I heard know. about the ghost stories. What ghost stories? Oh, oh. No, but actually, um, the other thing about that is, is bouncing off that, but there are actually quite a few ghost stories yeah. about Bukit China. And... In particular, in 1980, no, uh, 19, in the late 1980s, I can't remember the date now, I pulled up the newspaper article, but um, this is very soon after 1984 and all these kapapals. Um, nearby, in one of the sort of like sub hills of Bukit China, um, several bodies were exhumed, including that of a capitan. So people got very upset about this, uh, and in and you know, that's a whole episode one, uh, all together. But I think what was interesting is uh, a Chinese newspaper reported this 89-year-old Chinese woman who said she dreamt that ghost hands dig, dug up the graves um, of, of the Capitan. She dreamt that the Capitan's wife dug up the grave. Uh, and then the next day, you know, she woke up and a few days later she was like, oh my god, bodies were exhumed. <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know, um, and I think I think that that is sort of like one of one of the sort of like takeaways that uh, I, I I want to try to sort of convey in this, in this kind of like study is that um, it's easy to dismiss dreams and myths and memes and rumors as you know this, just dismiss them, but very often they affect political reality and affect the way um, affect material circumstances. Um, so so. Yeah. So you know, think about whatever myths there are in your life and <laughs> shatter your conception of your <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But it's a practical to me with uh Pardon? Uh 
Yeah, so um, I think what's interesting is obviously the history of Peranakan people in Malacca is also quite related to the history of the bis Chinese business community in, in Malacca and often there's quite some overlap. Yeah, chamber, yeah, chambers of commerce and basically, you know, you, you think of uh, sort of like infrastructure of the Chinese network the Chamber of Commerce, the your country club, uh, there's, there's uh, well, uh, Chinese schools, of course, the board of Chinese schools is very important. Um, what? Uh, temples, yeah, temples, Gongsi, um, clan associations, all that, and you know, these are like the, the sort of like social apparatus that um, play, part, play all these parts. Um, the the oh the Peranakan so so I think the right ah uh, so okay so uh, regarding the how the Malacca Peranakan community pitched it was that so you know if you want to analyze what constitutes Bumi Putranas you could say there's, there's several things right one is what I call patriotic pedigree. Right. So, are you a patriot? You know, i.e., was your race implicated in the emergency with the communists? If yes, then you are not of patriotic pedigree, which eliminates many people. Right. The second is you could say I categorize it as temp temporal sort of like importance. Who was here first? And you know, and that is a very important discourse. Um, and the third, I think this is this is very interesting. Is you know the word Bumi, Bumi Putra is your connection to the land, rootedness, um, and you know, and notably, most people um, aside were not uh, most Chinese. A lot of Chinese groups were not allowed to own land. Um, but crucially, when the Peranakan community of Malacca petitioned, they showed British documents that granted them land. So they were they they kind of argued like you know one culturally they say oh you know intermarriage um, intermarriage is a whole other thing because now a lot of Peranakan museums etc emphasize a history of intermarriage while well, historians have sort of like looked at it and said uh, it was not that common most Peranakan people didn't really marry Malay people mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day. Um, Pepper, you know, <laughs> you know, I look, he looks totally Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, right, but but this is a sort of like you could see this as a revisionist history, right? That now Peranakan people are very very interracial, and there's like a long history of the marriage. Um, the second is that they emphasize the sort of like customs, right? The cultural aspects of Peranakanness, uh, and and all that, and and of course. And then they, and then of course third, they downplayed the 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 Peranakan role in colo in the colonial government, um, and of course they they emphasized that they got land, and because they got land, they argued that because we were granted land, therefore in a way the British were were recognizing our indigeneity, which I think is an interesting argument. <laughs> Yeah, that, that petition didn't go very far. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, anything else? To, to last comment on your Hang Tua thing. Uh, after the election, Mahathir gave an interview to Al Jazeera, and he was asked a question about your proudest achievement. Anybody saw that? His answer was that, you know, in 1998, when everybody turned against me, Despite everything I had done, they said I was anti-Chinese, but that Chinese were the ones that kept me in power. So at the end of the day, we are Hong Kong. That's deep. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those BuzzFeed quizzes, you know. Like, are you Hang Tua or Hang Japan? Which Hang brother are you? Like, 
is uh, related to how we define who we pregnant is um, you know if you accept the story that Hanipo married the Sultan then mm, then you know the, the sort of like category of racial purity isn't quite there um, but also um, I think also importantly is that you know in, in the Sudan Melayu a significant portion of it is a genealogical narrative where they basically establish that the Sultan is descended from Skandar Zulkarnai as in Alexander the Great. Um, so you know, um, so I, I think um, we, you know, as, as sort of like historians, we have to resist uh, narratives of, of some minoritization, but also narratives of purity. Um, because of what even is authentic and what even is pure, you know, like you know, in the 1980s, Chendo was this, in the 1990s, Chendo was that, and you know, keeps changing. So, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs>